Tonight we have three amazing women speaking to us. Uh, again, Helen Stacey, Program on Human Rights, if you don't already know me, you'll know that this quarter we're looking at the role of United States human rights NGOs and philanthropic organisations and their work abroad in human rights, especially, but their work abroad. So a quick snapshot of where we've got so far. You recollect that Doug Rutson in, in our first talk said, yes, NGOs are proliferating, but the space for NGOs is being closed down by governments, including our own government. And this is a matter of great concern for all of us. At exactly the time that the rule of law is supposed to be opening civil space, governments are using security and rule of law arguments to close civil space. The following week, we had uh, a representative from the Mott Foundation and Free the Slaves to give us two different perspectives of a big philanthropic organisation that works abroad and how it stays close to the issues on the ground. Um, you'll re recollect that Nick Jakewski talked about local legitimacy, about accountability close to the ground, and that's really the litmus of effectiveness. And Maurice Middleburg from Free the Slave said that in a single issue human rights NGO, the key point for his organisation to stay honest to their mission was always, always to be rethinking how they're effective in the field. And he mentioned how they have a planning system that goes right back and asks questions of what are we doing, who are we trying to help, and how do we measure our efficacy. Last week, Sarah Mendelson, who is at CIS right now, but had been at State Department for four years with this current, with the, this current Obama administration, last half of the previous administration, the first half of this administration, and with a long, long human rights record, including writing the memo for the closing of Guantanamo, she remains hopeful, as we do all, that it might be closed before the end of this election cycle, mentioned that she thought there was great room for the academy and for not-for-profits here and abroad to collaborate in gathering public opinion data about efficacy on the ground with the populations that NGOs seek to help. She's worried about the disconnect between um, academic researchers and NGOs and the lack of information sharing between the two and that we're talking two different languages. So we've had some cautionary tales so far from three different perspectives. And tonight we have the perspective of uh, Musimbi Kanyoro, who comes to us from the Global Fund for Women. She will be following Christine Sherry, who runs Sherry Consultancy. A little bit about each of them, and then I'll introduce Kim Meredith to you, who is going to be tonight's moderator. Let me start with Christine, who will be uh, starting, kicking off tonight. Christine is the founder and principal of Sherry Consulting, where she advises philanthropic endeavours and philanthropists, donors essentially, about thoughtful giving in the philanthropic space. She also teaches a class at Stanford again this year, is that right? Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Before that, she was the founder of philanthropy, um, uh, founding director of the Philanthropy Workshop West, and this was an endeavour started in 2001 to, uh, to get philanthropists together here on the West Coast and to devise a series of educational programs so that there could be thoughtful giving. In other words, I think, and you'll correct me, I'm sure, Christine, if I'm wrong, that donors understand that it's not as simple as just giving money away. There needs to be careful understanding of the organisations that they're giving money to and some sense of how the NGO or, or um, philanthropic endeavour is cashing out on the ground its mission. And also that there can be many, many different sides to the same human rights question. 
working in the trafficking space, I, I can certainly tell you that there's many, many different sides of in the trafficking space that some who work against trafficking think that prosti all prostitution is trafficking and others will tell you that in the trafficking space it's the prostitutes who are the victims rather than the, the, the who are responsible for trafficking themselves and should be criminalised. And before that, she was acting in her role, other role as lawyer, um, general counsel for SRI International, which we've probably all driven past down here in Menlo Park, um, and has, I think, a very good finger on the pulse of how philanthropy and Silicon Valley together operate um, going forward. And I hope you'll talk something about your work with SV2 as well, Christine. Musimbi Kanyoro uh, is the second CEO of the Global Fund for Women. The first CEO is with us here, Anne Firth Murray. Can you put your hand up so people will know you? Uh, you're the third, I beg your pardon. Okay, thank you. Uh, Musimbi is a Kenyan, has spent a long time in Switzerland working for the world uh, YWCA. She is a long, lifelong advocate of educational programs for women and girls and has been recognised around the world for her work. She's got it's a very impressive list, three honorary doctorates, several recognition awards, including a leadership award from the Kenya government and most recently was named one of the 20 women women leaders for the 21st century by Women's E! News. The Global Fund for Women takes, essentially takes donations from donors and then disseminates that money to women's groups around the world working for women's empowerment and women's human rights. So tonight we have Christine talking to us about the donor interface, people who have money, they want to give that money thoughtfully for good causes around the world, and Musimbi who works for an organisation where the money is disseminated to those on the ground. To make the third of our uh, wonderful triptych of powerful women tonight, Kim Meredith, who's the inaugural executive director of PAX, Stanford Centre on Philanthropy and Civil Society, housed right here at Encina Hall. And before that, uh, before that started, I think in 2009, is that right, Kim? Uh, was working for Planned Parenthood, uh, both uh, in New York and before that here in San Francisco, and has had, for most of her career, a lot to do with the development side of those organisations, by which I mean bringing money in to the organisation for then it, its expenditure for the mission of the organisation. So clearly the theme tonight is money comes in from people who want to do good things with their money. What's the philosophy of helping those donors in directing their donations? What's the role of organisations who are the recipients of those donations? And then coming from Kim's perspective, who will be the interlocutor tonight, tonight asking the questions, what's the best way of trying to understand the interface between the money that comes in, the organisations that stream it out, and then to understanding the effect on the ground to the people that donors and organisations are trying to help. So with that, Christine, I'd like to ask you up first. Thank you. Well, thank you, Helen, for that lovely introduction, and I'm thrilled to be here with my friend Kim Meredith. I am a visiting practitioner at, at PAX and have had a wonderful opportunity to work with Kim and the great work that they do, and as well to be here with Musimbi and with Anne Firth Murray from the Global Fund for Women, an organization that is really unparalleled that I think just celebrated its 25th anniversary. I'm in awe of what, what you do, and I've gone to see many of your programs around the world with donors and, and think very highly of that. 
Um, I'm a proud Stanford grad. Um, I was a, in the first graduating class of the International Relations Program 800 million years ago. There were 10 of us in that class, if you can imagine. Um, and I was also a humanities um, honors undergraduate. I, I have a daughter who just graduated from Stanford. I live 10 minutes down the road. I teach a class here called Giving Wisely, which is for individual donors thinking about this. And I'm now teaching a class on on uh, you know how we build and support nonprofit organizations, so I'm real happy to be here, and I have many wonderful uh, ties to this place. Um, Helen asked me to talk a little bit about the world of philanthropy writ large, just so we could situate human rights funding in the context of what's going on in the field of philanthropy, which is you know a fascinating and very growing field both in the United States and globally. Um, I want to just say a word about you know, my own experience, which is that I, I had a long and interesting career practicing law, but then about 15 years ago, I got sprung from that, thankfully, um, and went to the Hewlett Foundation, where I ran a program, basically, as Helen said, educating donors. I had the fortune to take people around the world. Um, seeing programs like that of the Global Fund for Women and other programs on the ground, it was just an extraordinary opportunity in education. And I basically work with a lot of people, both in their individual capacities and a lot of the new foundations, many of them in the West Coast, just helping people think about how do you use your philanthropic money wisely, which you know is, a, is in many ways a very high class problem to have. But in fact, I think to make really smart, thoughtful philanthropic choices is one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I see people wrestling every day with how among all the needs that we have out there, even if we just limited them to the human rights arena, you know, how do you choose among groups? How do you think about what's the lever? What's the opportunity that is really going to move change in a meaningful way? And, and so as I um, talk a little bit further about some of the, you know, my own experiences in the human rights arena, I want to share with you some of the complexities and the challenges and the contradictions that can come in that. But first, um, Helen's asked me to sort of set the stage a little bit just about what's this world of philanthropy in the nonprofit sector. And my big takeaway message from you is this is a very large <laughs> and, in, in fact, kind of growing industry and a huge part of the American and global economy. Um, in 2012, the United States was home to over 86,000 foundations with assets over $715 billion, giving away $52 billion. Um, that, however, is relatively a drop in the bucket <laughs> compared to the total amount of US giving, which is in the 312 plus billion category. And last year was a very good year. So those uh, numbers are inching up. Um, one of the things most people don't know is that something like 72% of all of the philanthropy in this country comes from individuals, people like you. Um, people who maybe have a few more dollars than you and I. Uh, but nonetheless, individual giving represents the lion's share of where philanthropic dollars come from. As Helen said, I've worked with a lot of funders in Silicon Valley. It probably isn't a surprise to any of you that when you ask people relatively new to philanthropy, what are the things that they really care about? Often education is one of the very first things that's on people's list, um, followed uh, perhaps by uh, environment, which is coming along, particularly on the West Coast. I was fortunate to work with a lot of donors who came out of business who knew very little about human rights. And if you talk to them about human rights, they would not necessarily put that even on their radar screen. But I think as part of, part of encouraging people to think about human rights is exposure. So we took people globally around the world. We went to probably 15 different countries. We met with human rights leaders from all around the world. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about is human rights is really on the agenda now of funders um, in the Bay Area and, and local and nationally, both as it relates to domestic issues, uh, whether it be marriage equality or others, or certainly as it relates to global issues. And we're going to talk a little bit about more of those. Nonetheless, it's also true that only about 5% of uh, philanthropic go dollars go to international affairs. That number has inched up, but has not moved dramatically in this last decade. And that includes peace and security and human rights. Um, in, in 20, oops, sorry, wrong one. Uh, in, in 2013, a group called the Foundation Center, which is based in New York and tracks this kind of stuff, 
um, did a major study along with an umbrella group called the International Human Rights Funders Group. And th if, if any of you are interested in understanding trends in funding and human rights, they actually did a really great report, which I commend to you. And it's on these slides and happy to make that available to you. But essentially, um, there are, were, was about a billion two of dollars that went um, by American foundations to human rights uh, according to their latest data, the big players being the Ford Foundation and the Open Society Foundation started by George Soros. Um, there are areas that continue not to receive a great deal of time and money, and they're, they're in um, uh, the slide here. Sorry, I'm having problems with mine. Um, environment and natural resources is an area that tends not to get a lot. Um, civic and political participation, migration and displacement, uh, freedom from violence, um, and others. Um, our firm, with actually a help of a recent Stanford graduate, um, took a look at that and went a little bit deeper and looked at where there were some really uh, critical emerging areas. And some of these will not surprise you. Anybody who's following the LGBT global uh, battles would know that LGBT residents of nations that refuse to acknowledge their identity is an enormous and growing problem. Migrants in need of refugee aid is a huge problem. Indigenous people who've lost their communal lands is an enormous problem. People who are looking at issues around use of new technology, that's, that's an enormous issue. So despite the fact that human rights is getting more and more attention, I think, there are still enormous areas of need. The other issue is sort of where's the money going? And a lot of the money is going to certain regions, and probably some of these are not going to be a surprise to you. China, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Mexico, the Southern Gone, Russia and Eastern Europe, getting a lot of money from Soros and others. Those folks, while they're not receiving a great deal of money, because still the relative amount of money is small, uh, receive more. There are parts of the world that get next to no human rights funding. Um, West Africa, Central America, the Caribbean, Central Asia, Southeast Asia. This week, in fact, there is a group of international human rights funders meeting in the Bay Area talking about emerging areas of needs. So there's a, there's a lot of interest and a lot of opportunity. So Helen asked me to talk a little bit about um, sort of the state of funding. And I know for many people who are interested in human rights, kind of where are there some opportunities for you to make a difference and make this real? And I think we're going to have a chance to talk about this um, uh, a little bit in the Q&A. If I have kind of one takeaway for you tonight, what I want to say is this is an area that needs and demands your interest and support and attention. But I know around Stanford there's often a tremendous excitement around creating new institutions. And if I say one thing to you tonight, there are many, many extraordinary institutions out there where your time and your energy and your effort to raise money and to go volunteer and do work on the ground could be really useful. But, but before any of you think about starting a new human rights organization, let me just encourage you <laughs> with a note of caution. Um, there are extraordinary groups on the ground um, that are doing really uh, great work. Here's one of them, the Fund for Global Human Rights, started by my good friend Regan Ralph. She was a human rights lawyer. She was working for Human Rights Watch. She teaches at Harvard. She's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What she saw was that the amount of money that was going to human rights defenders on the ground doing the really tough work, you know, really literally risking their lives, was minuscule. So she started this, not unlike the model of a global fund for women, as kind of an umbrella group that would raise money from individual donors and then would get that out through a series of networks to human rights defenders on the ground. And these guys are courageous and powerful. And they, she has grown this group in 10 years to be an extraordinary organization. Um, but there are groups like this, and there are many, many ones. And you're going to hear from the Global Fund for Women a little bit about their great work. Um, there really is not, in my view, a need <laughs> to create more new organizations, um, certainly in, the, in this country. But how can we work in partnership with these great organizations that are on the ground and do this kind of work? Um, 
The other thing is that you know nonprofits have been proliferating in this country. <laughs> Um, there are now 1.6 million registered nonprofits, and there's another million that aren't. Um, and I read some statistic recently that showed that um, in the last 10 years, the numbers of nonprofits in this country has grown by 25%. So there's an enormous competition <laughs> for every individual donor dollar. And one of the challenges for you, if you want to work in this field, is sort of figure out where can you plug in who's the right one that you might want to be working with. But for individual donors, who I work with a lot, the challenge is there's, there are more organizations out there who want people's philanthropic dollars than the dollars exist. And so I think it's really worth remembering that if this is a field that you care about, how do you get smart about it? And how do you learn to do more? So now I want to transition a little bit to what Helen asked me to talk about. And she, she encouraged me to be, be a bit uh, a bit uh, challenging <laughs> to you. So I'm going to talk about my real life experience in advising donors in three different areas um, just in the last two years. Um, I've been personally working in this field since I was a young lawyer. I represented asylum refugees when I graduated from Berkeley um, back in the 80s. I've worked on human rights issues much of my life. Um, but now I'm kind of on the advising the donor side. And I'm frequently asked by donors who say, wow, I care about a problem. How am I going to find a smart way of leveraging my money, identifying the needs and the groups and the opportunities where my dollars are going to go far? And we're going to have some hope of tackling these complex issues. So um, a, a couple of years ago, I was approached by a number of people who I'd worked with in the program that I ran, the Philanthropy Workshop, as well as the um, Schmidt Family Foundation, which is the family foundation of Eric and Wendy Schmidt here in the Bay Area. Uh, many people at that point were reading and hearing a lot about um, the epidemic of violence against women in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. How many of you guys have heard or know about this challenge? I mean, it's a, it's a challenge that we, we can't escape. It's an enormously difficult um, area. And we, I was tasked by a couple of different funders to really dive deep and so spent about a year interviewing everybody I could talk to from around the world, reading every research project, really trying to understand what was this epidemic of violence about. And if you had philanthropic dollars you wanted to put to that problem, what could you do? What I found was that there were a number of organizations um, who I think in the spirit of trying to engage uh, people in my view, really oversimplified the problem. Some people would say, you know, it's really just all about conflict minerals. And if we're able to just solve the problem of conflict mineral supply chains, uh, you know, this epidemic of violence is going to end because that's really the root of why women get raped. They get raped around the mines, and that's a problem. Um, other people would say, no, 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 it's just about the army. It's just about, um, you know, if we could just clean up the army and do security sector reform, we could fix it. The reality is, this is an enormous, complex, and entrenched problem that comes from decades and decades of colonialism, from land conflicts, from inter-ethnic conflicts, from a variety of difficult, difficult challenges. And when you dig deep and you ask yourself, how do I deal with this complex human rights problem, there are at least 10 or 12 or 15 different avenues that you can take and that there is no single bullet, <laughs> and that any organization that tells you that there is a single bullet is probably also wildly oversimplifying the problem. So I have some pictures here, because for a long time, I think people thought, we're just going to solve the conflict mineral issue, or we're going to build more homes for women who have been raped and give them jobs, and then that's going to solve it. And my point to you is that it turns out that there are many strategies, many of which weren't even on people's radar screens. Like, maybe what we really need to do is promote more women political leaders running for office so they can be more engaged in some peacekeeping issues. And maybe there are a number of other issues. Land rights turned out to be an enormous cause of violence. Um, so my point of this Congo story is, is not to dissuade you from engaging on these issues, but to say if you want to take on complex issues, go deep. Spend time. Um, we have a report that's on our website that sort of summarizes some of these issues. And, I, and I, I, for one, found this to be one of the most complex and difficult issues I ever tried to take a look at. Um, 
in the last two years, our firm was also commissioned by two different funders to look at issues around a topic that is extraordinarily controversial, legalization or decriminalization of prostitution. And two different funders come to me, one of whom came at this issue from the vantage point of looking at issues around uh, decriminalization of drugs and said, wow, you know, from a harm reduction standpoint, uh, is there any analysis that looks at if, if there are decriminalization of prostitution schemes developing globally, are we seeing a concomitant reduction in uh, har harm profession uh, for women? In other words, are, are women safer uh, from a health perspective? Another uh, funder was interested in the link between prostitution and trafficking, as Helen referred to, and wanted to know uh, does decriminalization of prostitution lead to um, an increase in sex trafficking? So my team and I, again, spent close to a year talking to everybody we could, doing really deep analysis. And what we found was one of the most complicated and difficult issues to research that one can possibly imagine. But more importantly, what we found is people's ideology <laughs> tended to drive their view of the evidence, their arguments and the issues that they worked at. So it was very, very difficult to talk to people about the research and the data. And in fact, it was very difficult to find data and research reports that in some fashion were not informed by the ideology of the group that had looked at them. So we found people who cited a, a packet of evidence that said, oh, no, no, decriminalization of prostitution absolutely leads to a rise in trafficking. And other people who had a different ideological point of view said, I'm reading the same data, and that just isn't what it says. And so what I would say to you as good, smart students at this university, dig deep and question those sources. And think a lot about you know, what, uh, you know, who, who is writing this report? How do you sift through these? Can you find some fundamental themes? And, how you think about engaging on this issue because ideology matters. And asking deep questions, not just of the nonprofits that you're talking with, but also the funders you're talking with about what their ideology is, will often inform how they view this particular debate. Um, the third example I want to give to you um, comes from, again, something that came out of issues around trafficking, which was um, uh, an argument around safe harbor laws. Safe harbor laws basically exist because there's a statute called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and it says that a minor who's in, induced to engage in sex is, uh, for commercial purposes, is considered a victim of trafficking. But some states are going to go ahead and prosecute that kid uh, because they're engaged in prostitution. So there's a, there's a big movement going on in this field right now around should we create safe harbor laws, which are essentially a way of protecting young people from being prosecuted. Even within that narrow issue, you could see advocates all over the place. There was a group that said, no, we need to have uniform safe harbor laws, because that's the answer. And if we get that, that's great. We have other people who said, you know what? The problem is that prosecutors want to prosecute kids who were hauled in on sex crimes, and we need to educate them about the issue. Some people said, you know, the safe harbor business is not the problem at all. The problem is that kids don't have anywhere to sleep when they run away from home. And what we really need to do is have more, more housing in places like New York City. Um, some people said, you know, we need to incarcerate kids um, in order to give them services and actually as a way to induce them to testify against um, their trafficker. So again, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> who the funder was, who the nonprofit was, you know, your, your head could be scrambled. And the, the challenge when you think about working in human rights is how do you make sense of all this? And I'd say fundamentally it's consider the source. Whose right is it? Whose human rights are being invoked by whom? And according to whose set of values? Really, that's what this is all about. And philanthropy is just an expression of those values. So my, I guess my final comments, and I'm happy to take any questions, is as you think about your own engagement and as you explore the world of nonprofits and philanthropies, you need to explore your own biases. You need to understand the biases of the funders who are involved in this. 
here's two very different entities. The Polaris Proje Project is one, an organization very strongly against trafficking, and the lens through which they evaluate every legal option and every strategy is through that. Whereas the Open Society Foundation you know, fundamentally believes that sex work can be a choice for some women and believes that equating that um, with trafficking denies those women those choices. So I would say go into the field, work on this stuff, kick the tires, ask tough questions, examine your own biases, and it's going to make you a, a better advocate in this space long term. NIA works in five universities. We've trained over 500 young women. But more than that, these young women have gone on to start big sister programs in secondary schools, so they've reached thousands of young people. But recently, we've, we've inspired a lot of our young women to assume leadership positions in their universities. So we're seeing a lot of them move very rapidly up the progression in their companies, and many of them even start businesses. So that's very fulfilling and very exciting. My main motivation for sharing our knowledge of Wayu weaving and pottery is to teach the new generation of young women to survive financially. For centuries, we were just sharing these traditions among ourselves, but now our crafts have taken on a cultural significance for people all over the world, where Wayu art has become highly respected and valued. We are faced with many challenges. We want to bring genuine democracy to our country, so we need to focus on reconciliation. Women's League of Burma enables us to unite women from different backgrounds so we can work together for the benefit of our people and also focus on the changes that we need to make for our future. We organize seminars and workshops and also produce materials that talk about the importance of reconciliation, as well as democracy, justice, and equality for women. I have been fortunate to have women successors who have taken it to the next level. Each of them has launched an idea to improve the lives of others or has created a business to employ others. And so we're helping them build companies and organizations that will outlive them. What we teach them is you can have a vision that's bigger and greater than yourself to impact society in a positive way. And seeing them living that vision, it's exciting. It's a fulfillment of a dream. Mujer is Waju. Wayu women formed an alliance because we were trying to get justice for what was happening to our people with violence and with disappearances and with women's rights. We formed Wayu Women's Power. Soon we were criticizing the multinational companies who were exploiting the natural resources at our expense. We were stigmatized and called terrorists, and I had to leave my community and country because of threats from paramilitaries. Because of the civil war in Burma, many young children, like myself, had to hide in the jungle to run from the fighting. Because of that, we couldn't go to school. We didn't have medical care. These are very strong memories, which motivate me to continue this struggle, to bring justice to my people, and also provide opportunities for young women in our country. It's tough because with lower income kids, 
They are really fighting with survival issues. And you can see that everywhere you look. Hunger and poverty, and so prioritizing the issue of leadership and change might not seem so evident, but I think when they start working in their communities and making a difference, they realize that they have power and that they, they can work together to make a change happen. I think that women have to be economically self-sufficient. I am optimistic because we are working together with the young women and the elders to make everyone aware of what is happening in our communities regarding violence and human rights. People are really getting the message about the indigenous women in Colombia, especially the younger Wayu women, who are waking up about what is happening in our culture and what we can all do about it. It is not too late to create opportunities for the younger generation so they can get an education. Then they can contribute to their community. I'm really looking forward to that. What I see is a new breed of leaders a new group of young people who are just energized about the country's future, about their personal futures and the role that they can play in society. They want to step up and take on the challenges. And they inspire me because clearly the challenges have not stopped. <laughs> um, we haven't pulled down the mighty wall of oppression just yet. And so seeing their energy and their enthusiasm really energizes me. Thank you, Helen, for this invitation. I am very nostalgic when I come to universities because there is some unfinished business about teaching and being at places of education. After completing my PhD in this country, I went back home in Kenya with the intention of teaching at the university. And I taught at the university for a short time and then some other um, things called me, research in the field, and so on and so I haven't quite finished my teaching desire and my conversations with, with students and so when I come to places like here and I do this quite often in many, many places of the world, I feel like what am I doing in the social work of philanthropy when I should be teaching? Probably now I would like to teach philanthropy. <laughs> so it was good to be able to see someone who has come from where I've come and gone to teach in philanthropy. And so I want to begin by acknowledging the presence of uh, Anne Fat Marie, who is here, sitting. And just stand up in case there's people who don't know you. And yes, yes. And I, I asked her to come because I just think that there's some credibility in talking about an organization with the founder of that organization living and present in the, in the place where you're talking because it really holds me accountable to what I say. <laughs> and that was the reason that I thought she would be here. And the conversation that has just gone on before me really frames for me what I want to talk to you about. In the Global Fund for Women, we invest our resources, our knowledge, our thinking in women leaders who are leading organizations for change in their own places. And we do so because we think that that is the only way to be credible. And the reason I used my first five minutes with those women speaking by themselves, those three women leaders, a leader from Burma, a leader from Colombia, and a leader from Nigeria, is I wanted them to speak for themselves so that I don't take their voice and make it my voice, but really to illustrate to, to you how they see the world and how they interpret the work that we do and how we use our resources that we raise from individual donors. You saw the statistics of individual donors. And you also heard that those individual donors are often ordinary people like you and me. That in this work, I count myself a philanthropist because I give to this work. I give to this work through the Global Fund, but I also give to this work through other organizations that I care for. And I continually, as I have learned over the years, to tell other people and to speak to communities such as yourself, 
to begin to see yourself as those donors that are going to change the nature and the future of philanthropy in the world. So I want to share with you some of the things that we are doing currently that actually build on the foundation of the Global Fund, which has been there now for over 27 years, closer to 30 years. During which time, the Global Fund has not only raised and given money to many groups all over the world, over 5,000 groups in over 175 uh, countries, and uh, much, much closer to $150 million now that have been given through the Global Fund in small amounts which are very much uh, 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 in relationship to the budgets of those organizations, the leaders, the way that we identify them. I want to tell you some of the things that we are learning and some of the adjustments that we are making to the work that we are doing mm -hmm. because as we think of the future. One, in the beginning it was really important for us to be able to raise the funds and give the funds to the needed groups. But today, we also feel that another aspect of grant making or of philanthropy is ensuring that what you care for in the work that you do really does get a hearing. So influencing the hearing on those issues and being able to actually tell the world whether there is resources for those issues and the changes that are happening in those issues. So when we claim that we fund or we give core funding to women's organizations or women-led organizations, we found that one of the things that we really have to say to the people to keep them really focused is what that change looks like. So when we have leaders such as the ones that you've, you've had, we really are also focused in funding them to evaluate their work and in funding them to be at spaces where they can tell their work and in finding them to connect to those people, just the gap that you identified, the lack of the connection with the, with, with the, with the academia in terms of the research, and really in trying to get some of that work that has been researched by other people and bring, bring it on the ground for the work that they do. We really found that that's something we need to do. Because if we don't do that, then our statements of the change that is happening are sort of like either short or in contradiction with what is happening. Because the media, the popular media, does raise out what is wrong with the world. The popular media doesn't often tell you what the local people are doing about it. It might tell you about a celebrity who goes from place and goes to a particular area and does something and then gets back onto the jet and flies away. It might tell you about that. And it will tell you that that celebrity has done really a great, a great job. And we do want to change that way of thinking as we go into the future. But really, having the grant making and the advocacy and amplifying the voices of the change makers on the ground really go hand in hand and see that as areas to use philanthropic money. Because very often, people who donate or who give money to local organizations far away expect they give project money and they follow that project individually as if a person's life today is this and then they have to stop it like uh, like you can think of a mother now uh, there's money out there for education and so they they have to think about education but nutrition is completely in a different pocket etc that's not how people live their lives people live their life very hol holistically and that's some of the things that we want to make another area that we've really learned and what we are trying to do is to ensure because we've always said we are about move building or supporting movements that will be there for a long time so I want to tell you about movements you see when you find a project or an individual etc when that person is no longer there or that project has stopped, the funding for it has stopped, etc. So that sometimes is the end of that. And I come from a continent that has had a lot of experimental projects. And every day there's another pilot being dreamt somewhere in big cities. The reason why the Global Fund and movements uh, building organizations, they really believe that this is about creating a consciousness in a large group of people that can connect with each other. And even if one section of them goes out today, 
the, it, it arises somewhere else. Movements are about being sold to an idea and understanding the political nature of that idea, the sociological nature of that idea, the cultural nature of that idea, the economic nature of that idea, and really being able to do such strong analytical force that today, if you belong to the movement of LGBT, and tomorrow you see another group of people who have nothing to do with the LGBT but their rights, there is injustice being done to them. You don't stand up and say, no, I am about LGBT. You actually organize and do something about that cause. We've seen the movement building when there's disaster. Like for example, there isn't um, uh, in the Philippines. The very groups that we had been working on who are doing economics, empowerment for women, who are doing preventing violence, stepped right in and organized people to face the disaster area. This is what movements do. They get a philosophy. They learn the depth of it. They analyze. They connect with others. So we connect these organizations so that they don't remain organizations. So that the work that would be done by Human Rights Watch, the Global Fund for Women, the Global Fund for Children, in some ways all these are movements and they are conscious of each other and they must be able to find where the connections are. Taking to them to the places where there's common actions by movements. Like, Currently in San Francisco, the, global, um, the, the International Human Rights Funders Group are meeting and there are groups of people from everywhere who are part of these particular movements. One last thing I want to say about why those, that becomes important. Yesterday, I, I came here this, today just from that meeting and I was in that meeting from yesterday and today. And yesterday on the panel, there was a woman who is representing a grant making group for LGBT people in Eastern Africa. And uh, uh, you heard some of you about Uganda having put into place uh, some, uh, a law that was actually going to kill people if they are LGBT. And some countries have tried to in, uh, put into place that, those kind of laws. And so uh, what she said, which was very interesting and even uh, uh, useful for me, is she said that when people have come to us in East Africa, in Uganda, etc., they have asked us to address and protect these particular individuals alone. That is not what we are about. We are about, these people live in societies, they live in communities, and we are about using a method of protection that protects the whole area of the democratic decisions that we want to make, of which this one, which is ours is one of them. And unless we can be credible to a larger frame of democracy and choices and uh, abilities for, 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 for people to, 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 to actually challenge different things, we are not going to be successful. Which was really nice to hear that come from herself, an African LGBT person who is affected. That's what we, what we believe in. That's what we believe that the philanthropic dollars should be used for, to build the capacity to protect the individual, uh, individuals who are leading change within their communities and to actually make sure that that change sus is sustainable. I want to um, stop by saying that we, ha we invest in organizations, so our really strength is actually taking what it takes to choose the right organizations and the right leaders. Some are just small. Some have their first ideas and nobody has actually verified them. And we, tr we believe in them. And then we build them up by not taking their intellectual property, which is their knowledge, but seeing what it means for them to have some resources that actually popularize the idea, help them to grow, help them to get acceptability, etc. And they run the show, and we recognize that. And it really works. I hope that during the question and answer, you can ask some specific questions that you have. But I wake up every morning not really feeling I'm going to work, because I wake up every morning going to do something I entirely believe in with my whole heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Ms. Simbi. Um, I think all of you can see that we have two incredible leaders here.
And just very briefly, in summary, we've heard Musimbi talk about the Global Fund for Women. And what I heard coming out of that was the importance of identifying and investing in women leaders, helping them um, create networks and um, learn how to mobilize and create these social movements to actually impact change. So coming at the problems by building community through women. What I also heard was some very specific examples um, referencing the LGBT community in eastern Kenya, some of the challenges there, um, economic opportunity in northern Nigeria and Nigeria, which I think all of us are fully aware of. So really compelling stories there. At the same time, um, the underpinnings of what we heard there were really highlighted by Christine and how she talked about um, how philanthropy can fund these types of activities and what philanthropy on a broader sense looks like here domestically and what that impact is on an international basis. She also gave some pretty compelling examples. Um, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the epidemic of violence as she termed it, legalization of prostitution and the issues related to that, the pros and cons, um, and then these safe harbor, harbor laws around trafficking victims. So I think we've had a really good summary this evening of some very key issues in the human rights arena that you were all studying and hearing about. But then now let's put that into the context of what is the role of philanthropy. So let's start um, with some of the information that um, Christine mentioned, and I'll just illuminate on that a bit more. That, um, well, it's five philanthropy is 5% or 5% of philanthropy goes towards human rights issues. The good news is that international affairs grew over 12% between 2000 and 2012 in terms of the philanthropic dollars as compared to only about 7.9% for the rest of the philanthropic dollars. So that's a good news. There's more and more awareness around international affairs. We've actually seen both in 2011 and 12, whereas environmental um, funding might have been a bit larger, it sort of flipped and international funding um, took in more of those dollars. So Christine also illuminated that um, private funding really is the key to global humanitarian aid and development efforts in this field and that 72% of those philanthropic dollars come from individuals who are living, another 8% come from individuals who are passing on, and then 15% of philanthropic dollars come from foundations. So when you put all of that together, that's 95% of the philanthropic dollars, and then you add in corporate social responsibility, which actually when we get into human rights issues, places like Sierra Leone and the um, conflict mine areas, corporate social responsibility does come into play. So that's sort of the philanthropic landscape that um, Christine was referencing. So then let's take a look at these questions here. How do you find balance between some of this outcome-oriented philanthropy that we talk about, strategic philanthropy, driving towards outcomes and impact, yet when we talk about human rights issues, these are very sort of fuzzy in many ways. Um, you know, they're qualitative issues, not just quantitative. So how are you going about evaluating your impact and then using that as a way to bring in donors and match donor intent with the needs of your organization? So first for you, um, Ms. Simbi, in terms of the Global Fund for Women, and then Christine, maybe for you in terms of overall donor match. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. One of the things that I think we should really be clear about is uh, when people ask for work to be evaluated, they don't mean just bring the statistics of what has happened. Even donors, including individual and foundation donors that we talk with, do understand that you need both to have the statistics and you need to have uh, uh, data for statistics, but you also need to be able to tell the stories of people's change. What has been important for us at the Global Fund is to illustrate and to have some idea of what it is that we want to see happen by the experience of many, many years of working with the grantees. And we really saw for ourselves 
What works is to look at change in four areas. What is happening to the individuals in that society in terms of their own consciousness raising of the issues that affect them? What is happening communally as the second level of change? Individuals realizing, for example, if you are in a society that has got female genital mutilation and you decide that it's not good for you by yourself, that's all right, but it doesn't change that practice. But when the whole community begins to reframe and see it different, you see the change. And if you are with community a long time, you see how these issues come from individuals and go to the community. And we can be able to provide data for that. It's not lack of data for that. Then there's the other issue, when people are able to identify what kind of resources that helps those changes. Whether those resources is people, it's money, it's knowledge, it's um, uh, laws, it's policies. We can be able to provide evidences for that. And there is ways of being able to collect data. And we see no reason that we should not be part of the people that collect data for that kind of information. And then once those laws and policies and regulations and other things are in place, the third level is do people utilize them? Because there are so many good things out there. There are even budgets that are assigned to groups of people who never actually know that those budgets have been <laughs> assigned to them. So we also try to track and say, where is the consciousness of things that are working for the communities that we work? And feel, we feel strongly where we are in the life history that there's nothing wrong with having some data that is qualitative and quantitative. And that data is good because other people learn from that data. So that's how we try to track what we are trying to do. But at the same time, I should say in my, myself in conclusion, we also try to see whether we can track some data on what we mean by movement building, how are the movements connected by themselves, what, what exactly are they doing together, when don't they do it well together, and when do they do it well together. And so some of our grant making uh, right now is to try to learn re, uh, uh, from the back, from what we have learned, in, and then to try and learn from fo forward uh, trying to imagine what it would look like, but learn from the others because there are so many people that are working on movements. And we can even take something like the civil society, the, the, the civil society, uh, the, no, the civil um, movements in this country yeah. and learn something from them. Mm -hmm. What made them work? And um, the whole area of leadership too is another area that we track because you can be able to try and see how chain of leadership has made a difference in people's lives. So it's a, a, it's a, it's a question we're not afraid for about, but it's a question that we like to dialogue with whoever is asking, be it a donor, a scholar, a doubting person, uh, a philanthropist. We want to have a discussion and see, does the understanding and our understanding go together? And if not, can we convert them to think like us? Because we are smart. <laughs> That sounds Great. rather compelling. I think you can. I think you can. So convince us, Christine, um, how you'd convince your donors and how you would address that you know, The very question. first thing I'll say is philanthropy is a long game. I mean, philanthropy is not business. This is not quarterly reports. And philanthropy is not an edu uh, election cycle. I mean, philanthropy exists as risk capital, so you can invest long term in change that takes time. You know, the Global Fund for Women is only 25 years old. And there are other groups like that that are only 25 years old. And these problems are deep and long. I love what Ms. Simbi said about you know, thinking about what philanthropy leaves behind. The world of philanthropy and philanthropic projects are littered with people coming in with a project and giving it a couple of years and then walking away. And it's in the kind of investment in long-term leadership development and change and an understanding the variety of complex forces that lead to the problems that we're looking at <laughs> that makes you know really great philanthropy from <laughs> investing in a project where once you're gone, that project's gone, and that's money often down the drain. I, I think we do need to ask questions about impact. We need to understand in learning from each other in all kinds of an analyses, both qualitative and quantitative, what is it about a particular organization or a leader or a, or a way of framing or advancing an issue that is special? You know, I love what you said a minute ago about taking lessons from 
other civil rights battles in this country. I've been working a lot with the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund that was one of the very first funders that funded the marriage equality debate 15 years ago. 10 years ago, for those of you who are around, you remember when Gavin Newsom announced that he was going to um, perform uh, marriages with gay people. People thought that he was putting the movement back um, decades, and even a lot of people in the LGBT movement at that time weren't so sure that marriage was the battle. But if you actually study that as a philanthropic investment, as, as, as what I think is one of the great human rights issues of our time, you'll see that that was a really brilliant effort at movement building that had, has had now remarkable results. I mean, the issues before the Supreme Court, this issue is fundamentally being decided in our lifetime in the last decade. And there are things I think we can all learn from different kinds of movements, but it's not bean counting. And anybody who would suggest to you that this is about bean counting or just counting the number of people or how many houses got built, how quickly, I think, is missing the boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we talk about um, the way foundations engage with communities. They might be a partner in social change. Yeah. And certainly my own experience at Planned Parenthood, where I was for many years, you know, we had partners like the Packard Foundation when Musimbi was there. <laughs> um, or we think of them as sort of a driver of social change, the way we describe the Gates Foundation today, that they're doing sort of the, the up and down. They've got the bed nets on the ground, and they're doing the malaria research. So they're driving social change on an issue to eradicate malaria, if you will, or maybe a catalyst for social change. And um, certainly, the Hewlett Foundation work in climate, today we talk about carbon footprint, but before the year of 2000, nobody had ever heard of that. So they really became a catalyst of a new idea, new language, and new thinking. So when you think about how the Global Fund for Women, or you're thinking about, Christine, the approaches that you're trying to counsel your donors as they engage in human rights, and what are the sensible approaches um, how do you think about it in terms of either a partnership, um, a driver of change, or a catalyst of change? Or is it a totally different approach in the human rights movement? Mm -hmm. Can I go fast this time? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, well, you know, I, um, I think first that um, philanthropy needs a little humility around its ability to create movements. <laughs> I, th I actually think much of the research shows philanthropy doesn't create movements. Mm -hmm. Philanthropy might catch a wave of something that is already bubbling, already beginning to happen. And I think mm -hmm. philanthropy's job is to provide that patient capital mm -hmm. to support the people on the ground who are doing the work and find ways responsibly with a lot of listening <laughs> and a lot of awareness and not bringing our own uh, worldview <laughs> in to fix uh, a local problem. Um, you know, I, I do think philanthropic capital can be really critical if deployed smartly and well and sensitively over time <laughs> to help create the, uh, the scaffolding upon which movements can grow. And investing in leadership is huge. I mean, from the marriage equality movement that that Haas Jr. and others funded. You know, they were funding groups on the ground that were trying to change the way in which Americans thought about and conversed about um, gay marriage. Uh, they weren't leading the fight. <laughs> they were supporting the fight from behind and being nimble and being willing to listen and change course when they were realizing that the strategies weren't working, but I think it's very much in partnership, and I'd say philanthropy can be a strong catalyst, but it's not going to substitute for work that must deeply be felt on the ground and, and come from that space. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that Anne is dying to say something about it, about this from her experience. Uh, of creating the Global Fund, but let me give an interpretation of it. <laughs> <laughs> what I heard from uh, Anne Fath Marie was that she was actually motivated by being in the center of philanthropy, one working for the Hewlett Foundation at that particular time, and giving away a large amount of money to organized uh, international large NGOs to which women who are working from underneath 
did not have access to, and yet they existed. Mm -hmm. And I think Anne did tell me that she was motivated by a group that she visited in Mombasa, mm -hmm. Kenya, <laughs> 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 which motivated her to say, these women also require funding. Mm -hmm. But here, the balance was, I also worked for a foundation before coming to the Global Fund. I did exactly the same job that Anne had at Hewlett for the Parkhead Foundation. And so I also realized that I had the power to, give, to be able to give away the foundation's large amount of money, but the kind of groups that the Global Fund was funding did not have access to it. So here, I want to use the word catalyst and say, I think that what, 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 what happened there, there are several things that happened for me. One was to catalyze an innovative idea that when women who may be seen to be grassroots, who may be seen to be not having the power, it doesn't mean they don't have the brain or the vision to do change. But when you trust them and you can be able to support them, those ideas grow and they become, they speak for themselves. So the groups that have been funded over these 25 years of, with the Global Fund have shown that because, listen, we don't go looking for grantees. Here is an organization that sits in the Bay Area and receives over 3,000 applications from women who are doing very, very important work and increasingly from men who are also working in the areas with women. And they are doing this important work and they will do it whether we are there or not because they are giving their services, they are giving their blood, they are in the front lines of defending the human rights in every way that they can think of. It's land rights, it's inheritance, it's um, reducing harmful practices on women, it's introducing uh, possibilities for women to have access to reproductive health. I gave you a pamphlet to show how we work. So philanthropy can be a catalyst. But philanthropy, I disagree with you, can help also build things. Because by helping to build, it's not that they should, they should not take the credit for building it. But where groups are not connected, either because they don't know each other, they are competing for resources, uh, they are competing for ideas, etc. Philanthropy can bring this convening power to be able to say, come on, come together and talk together. Maybe there's something that you can learn together and see if you can build. And sometimes even say, put some incentives. The Dutch government gave us incentives to say when we, were, when we got some grant from them, work with some local strong groups that are doing evaluation, yeah. at the, that's, that are doing um, building um, capacity. And so we would be able to put groups that bring different things together. And in that way, you're actually building something that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. And philanthropy has, can have that possibility. If, yes, I do agree that philanthropy, especially Western philanthropy, does need to have some humility. Because there is a way in which lack of belief of what comes from the South is so evident in the spaces where we work within, within the West. And so I think that that's one of the pride of the Global Fund, that we often fund, um, we fund mainly in the South, and we really believe in those leaders, and we really believe in the kind of knowledge contribution that they bring, not only moving the agenda on, we don't just expect them to be the ones who have the hands on, but to bring the ideas that make that change. And I think that that's part of where our philanthropy has some humility in it. Yeah. No, <laughs> yes. I, 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 I think your point is really well taken that Philanthropy can, has the opportunity to convene, has the opportunity to get people to talk with one another where that, that doesn't happen. Um, I think that the challenge really for many, especially newer American donors, individual donors, is we tend to trust people who we know. We tend to like to fund the organization that's around the corner and maybe the founder looks like us and they went to the same school and you know, we speak the same language, and I think there is often a very unconscious bias that organizations and solutions that are built here uh, are going to be the ones that are going to be more successful or scale more quickly or be able to, in some fashion, um, break that log jam. And I think the challenge for us is to be humble enough to realize, yes, occasionally there is a role for these new institutions or ideas driven from here. Ideally, um, 
you know, I, in the research that we did on Congo, it was shocking to me how much money went to very, very, very large U.S.-based institutions where $5,000 of that mm -hmm. given to, you know, a group of women student leaders in Goma, in, in any one of a, a number of small cities could fund that group for a year. And yet, most Americans didn't know the names of those groups. They didn't know how to find them. <laughs> And so that's why organizations like Global Fund and other groups like Fund for Global Human Rights that are that connection point are so powerful. Thank you for those responses. Um, it really illuminates, I think, the complexity of the problems, the complexity of doing the work and funding the work. So I'm going to ask one last question and then open it up so that we at least have the last 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So I'm giving you the warning, and hopefully all of you are thinking about a question or two. You know, we've heard everything from sort of data is good when it's used in the right way, and clearly there are ethical issues around sharing data and humanitarian and human rights issues. Um, we've heard about these biases that come in as people bring either as the funder or a leader of an organization. Um, so when we really bring all of this together, we can see that these are really complex social problems that we're dealing with. Um, and it's really um, an opportunity for an interdisciplinary group of students, such as all of you, cross-sector leaders who might be in the room, to think about how you engage in this work. Um, and you've also pointed out that we're also um, often stuck for decades with some of these problems. So how can students find a meaningful point of entry? And where can they learn um, what they need to know in order to figure out how to engage in this work? Mm -hmm. Uh, let me be personal here because I do believe personal stories are really useful and here. When I was really young and at the university back home, I had an opportunity to go for an internship that was created through the United Nations uh, to travel to Indonesia. I think I was like, I was still uh, in my first year at the university, uh, maybe 19, 18 or 19. And I went and, uh, to Indonesia, and there we were an, uh, quite a, uh, a large group of young people that had been brought together for that learning mm -hmm. opportunity. For me, it was an eye-opener when we learned together with several young people from everywhere in the world. And then thereafter, the year I came back home uh, to, to the university in Kenya, and uh, I campaigned to be a general secretary of the U United Nations Youth Association of the university, uh, because there were several associations inside. And that just gave me lots of opportunity to travel in Africa and abroad. What I'm trying to say is that one way of engagement when you're still at school mm -hmm. is to be interested and involved in things that get you outside, that push the limits, that get you to see the world beyond. Um, we have a saying in my uh, own language which says that once you discover that there are other mothers who cook just as well as your mother, <laughs> as your mother, you begin to enjoy all kinds of deities in the world. And that's the same with knowledge and involvement. So getting involved for me was really one of the things that opened. It's never, it never stopped. Then it just from there, a way was opened. Um, my first country, Indonesia, and then thereafter I had international travel, I had local travel, I had um, travel inside my own continent in Africa. So the second thing is that I have found that here in the USA, I, by the way, I did all my graduate school, school, school here, I did my master's in the USA, master's and PhD uh, in the USA, so it, I, I know the opportunities here are more than anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. When you're in high school, you can get opportunity to go abroad. When you are at the university, you get these opportunities as to study abroad, etc. Some people take these things serious and others. And you in Stanford, you're in a privileged place. You have everybody from everywhere coming to you. You have all the knowledges from just taking advantage of it. Internships, also I found them really good, very, very important. Even at the Global <coughs> Fund, we offer internships. And we actually offer like 15 internships in the summer. 
we increased. We used to have very few internships. Or, stay, or picking up places where you can work for a year and not really focusing fast on, on making money. Focus fast on making knowledge and experience, and then you make money to come. Yeah. <laughs> it will come, etc. So exposure to me is one of the ways. And then the second thing is taking a step of faith on how you choose your dissertations or your term papers. Because your term papers give you opportunity to write to an organization and say, I am interested in um, doing something on food, and I hear that you sell this kind of food, or I'm interested in women's philanthropy on something on violence on women, Global Fund, can, we, can I do a study in your, of your organization? These can open you to thousands of organizations all over the world. And the third one that I would like to actually um, mention about is that for me, it's also having a vision and an ambition that is beyond yourself. Like I always say, when I grow up, I'm still growing up. Mm -hmm. I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, re I and working towards that, whatever that you want to be. Mm -hmm. Because it's really useful. It helps to have a focus. And there are so many, many, many different ways that uh, I can. But those have been useful for me. It, they have been useful for me. And I have sometimes pushed the envelope. You know, I studied linguistics. Then I left my, and did a lot of field research in linguistics helping languages that had not been written to be written in places, in many, many places on the continent of Africa. And then I said, I've not done enough of research in linguistics. I want to do something completely different and move to Geneva for 20 years to experience working internationally. And then I said, I've done enough in movements. I want to go to philanthropy and came to work with Packard Foundation, an area that I had not been in and learned philanthropy. And I'm now moved from that foundation philanthropy into the Global Fund, which is a publicly supported uh, kind of foundation. But pushing the envelope beyond just what you are interested on, for me, that has been useful as well. Yeah. Yes. Well, she stole all my good lines. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the travel thing. I was a junior here, and I got a little grant to go to Mexico and live uh, in Mexico at a time where not that many people spoke English, lived in and it was my, my parents didn't have a lot of money. I never had a chance to travel. It opened my eyes hugely. I t I've taken our kids with us all over the world. I mean, you are, you are as Ms. Simbi said, in a place where you can get a $3,000 or $5,000 travel grant, or you can bug your faculty and, and find ways of doing research projects. And get out and go. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it alarms me a little bit, because I'm close to your generation, because we have three kids in their 20s. The, you know, the idea that you're not going to take the time to go and study your work overseas because somehow you have to drill down. You know, we're, we've been at this for a while. Life is long. You've got to repot yourself a lot. I didn't know what I was going to do when uh, I was an undergraduate. You know, I kind of stumbled into law school. And, and I think if you can be open to those experiences and travel and follow your nose and get internships. I think for the first 10 years of my life, I had internships that paid me enough to you know, get my Metro card and sleep on somebody's couch. Um, that's all a good thing, because it opens your eyes to the world that's out there. And I think it gives you an appetite. And this is not a field that, this is the, the opposite of a linear uh, field. And those of us who you know, are lucky enough to work in it have taken a long time to get here. Right. But I would say, just go out and grab everybody. I, I've, had, I've hired 20 Stanford kids in my practice in the last five years. The young person who wrote the, our International Human Rights Report was a graduate here, and he went to the London School of Economics for a year, and he showed up on my doorstep and said, I want to write this report. I said, great. You know, so um, I, I'd love to talk to any of you who were interested in this work. And I'd just echo Ms. Simbi that I'd say, just go out there and start it. And there's some great ways to do that. Um, certainly at Stanford PAX, we have small grants, $500 to $2,500. And we certainly support undergraduate research work. Um, so you can always apply once a quarter for that. The Haas Center for Public Service um, has all sorts of ways to engage in international 
um, work and they underwrite and support that. There are also summer philanthropy fellowships and then there are postgraduate philanthropy fellowships. So there are a number of ways and the John Gardner um, fellowships. So there are a number of ways here on campus to engage in some of that work. How about some questions from the audience? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Hi, I don't know, is it working? You have it now, um, yes. Good, so I'm a Knight Fellow in Journalism here at Stanford, and I'm also a California credentialed um, public school teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, my space, or what I want to be doing, um, has to do with uh, building a global network for student journalists around the world. Um, but the argument, I'm, I'm having, oddly, a really tough time making um, an argument about civil, civil society, civic engagement. Um, I really do believe that connecting student journalists around the world will help them um, get stories out about their lives and about their cultures and will um, improve civil society in their countries. But um, I'm, I'm having a hard time making that argument in, in a way that I think would appeal to a funder. Um, I can make that argument to teachers, I can make it to schools, I can make it to other journalists, but um, having someone actually spend money on that is something, I, I don't, I'm new to this, and so it's, it's uh, difficult for me to find sort of a frame for that. And I'm wondering if those are programs you've dealt with and how you make that argument about elevating, um, el fundamentally elevating the level of public discourse especially in societies that, that really don't have it. Mm -hmm. And um, would you like to address that and maybe even yes. bring yeah. in some of the, like yeah. the witness approach? Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, do you want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of funders who fund media. And, you know, that is not a huge um, program area in a lot of the large established foundations. And I think even within those foundations that do fund media, there tends to be much more, as you probably know from your work at night, you know, much more work in, in terms of just thinking about how do we support independent media in this country. I do think it's a really interesting idea. I think the thinking about, you know, how do you go from um, connecting student journalists in different regions, what, what's unique and special about this vision that's different than other opportunities that probably do already exist um, would be really important. And then doing some research on, you know, where's that intersection of people who care about civic discourse, public engagement, international exchange, and the role of journalism. You know, that's a lot of just reverse engineering research around philanthropy that when you're trying to start a new organization, you know, can be challenging. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I th there's a lot of interest uh, generally in the civil society about protecting journalists, having journalists in place. You can even see the U.S. embedding journalists in uh, very strategic right. places, even within the army, etc. So I can't tell you about who funds that work because uh, I am not too familiar. I have seen people who work in that area, I don't know how they are funded. So in a one-to-one, -to -one I can probably give you some, yeah. some people that I know that do that kind of work, but I don't know how they are funded. I yeah. mean, you might go through, you know, regionally, like groups like the National Endowment for Democracy yes. that does support yeah. some local, like, like that, literally that Congolese group of young Congolese journalists was supported by NED. And, okay. you know, there are probably ways of sort of yeah. maybe, you know, talking to some people at OSF there's um, even an organization here in San Francisco yeah. that brings journalists for interns and some yeah. of them have But what I might be thinking about rather than starting a brand new group is thinking about who, how can you partner with some other yeah. folks and piggyback on that. So the advice would be follow the money. Go and look at um, Global Witness Program and who's funding it. Um, look at one of your colleagues in the program. Um, Marianne Santos, who has um, this new, where CBS and Univision have come together, and they are funding Fusion, and I believe she's in the Knight Fellow Program this year. And then take a look at Global Girl Media. It's, um, st it was started by an Emmy Award-winning um, filmmaker, and she's based in Oakland. 
and she's been doing work, um, social justice work in Oakland and South Africa. Um, so those are some places. Um, see who's funding them, follow the money, and you can work your way upstream from there. Let's end with a final question from the wonderful Ann Firth Murray. You don't have a question? Oh. Your comments about philanthropy reminded me of, uh, of my, uh, the, the metaphor that I often used about the Global Fund for Women as a garden. And I, uh, and many people have said this, but I truly believe that in, when, when you're making grants, when we are making grants, when we're giving donations, really, uh, if it's effective, it really is just the compost. It's not the water. Uh, money, money, money is not the water. Uh, and I'm glad that at some point you both began to talk about what really drives social change, which is commitment. Um, connections between people, people with ideas. And I, I don't think I've ever seen an example of an organization, of a, of a project or an organization that really worked and became significantly effective without knowing that it was initiated at the ground, at the grassroots. It was initiated there. And then the money came in and hopefully the money was given like fertilizer. Uh, they are planting the seed, they're digging the earth, and you know, when you put fertilizer on your plant, it makes it grow more healthily and faster, but it, but it isn't the water that makes it grow. Mm -hmm. And that's the commitment and hard work of, of uh, local people, I think. So I always thought, and I, so I resonate with much of what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And is the class ended at seven o'clock? So I'm going to very quickly um, just say, to all of the students and other folks in the room. Imagination is a preview of life's coming attractions. You all have much to do in your life, and it is limitless. If you imagine it, go after it. And that's what you're hearing from Musimbi and from Christine. And their leadership has so um, far exceeded, I think, anyone's imagination. So please join me in thanking them for their incredible work.